it's a really hard balance. And the, the analogy that I use, the metaphor that I use internally is, we are trying to create a menu. We are not trying to be a private chef. And we need to make sure that customers understand that we have a menu yeah. and there are there's enough on that menu that I think there's something you're gonna love. But for the right price it, and the right quantity, we yeah. may be willing to customize a menu. There are customers who assume that we're a private chef. And what we've learned is that those customers are the hardest to serve because they really don't know what they want. Yeah. You know, they tell us they want a pizza shaped like a hamburger that's actually a cake. <laughs> and then you can't possibly satisfy them. Are you ready to elevate your leadership skills in the electronics manufacturing industry? Join Sana Vinding on a transformative journey as she unlocks the key to exceptional leadership in this dynamic field. Discover invaluable strategies, emerging trends, and best practices through expert perspectives and insightful interviews. This podcast is your ultimate resource for gaining a competitive edge, staying ahead of the curve, and shaping the future. Tune in now and unlock the secrets to leadership success in the world of electronics manufacturing. I'm your host, Sana Vending, and thanks for listening in today. Today, we have the pleasure of delving into the fascinating world of innovation and design with our special guest, Matt Johnson. Matt is the CEO and co-founder of Layer.io, a visionary company that focuses on smart building, monitoring, and preventative maintenance solutions. With a background in industrial design engineering, Matt brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. His impressive career includes roles as co-founder and advisor at Bear Conductive, and as well as a visiting tutor in innovation design engineering at the Royal College of Art. So welcome, Matt. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Yeah, excited. So I always love to start with this like question because we all have our different mm. passions. So, you know, what excites you about the electronics industry? Well, I mean, I think I came to it because... I love the interaction between the physical and the digital. So um, I I am a, a car, motorcycle, bicycle geek. Anything with wheels or wings, I get excited about. And I remember very well as a child um, reading a car magazine talking about the, the rise of fuel injection and the computer in the car. And I thought it was so interesting as a young kid yeah and i remember thinking how does it but how does it work and i i really got in that was for me the interest the, the seed of the interest in in electronics was i i'm interested to know how the car effectively makes decisions and um i also loved that interaction between the physical vehicle engine whatever and the software and the firmware and um and and really, that was it. That was the passion that I had. And it exists today as well. We're putting devices yeah. in buildings and seeing them on the internet. That's incredibly exciting. Yeah, I like I like that. It's always good to hear, you know, how you you fostered, right? Or you saw that, got that inspiration. <laughs> mm -hmm. What about, so with the name of the podcast, right? Because I called it Mind the Innovation. So I want to talk to you yeah. about that because the innovation is so different for everyone. So what does mm. the word innovation mean for you? Oh, what does innovation mean? <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I certainly think for me, for it has to be meaningful invention is probably the shortest definition I would give it. And yeah. uh, the reason I say that is that not all invention is meaningful um, and not all meaningful things are inventive. So you have to put those both together in order to to really call it innovation. And, um, you know, I like running a business that does a lot of innovation, I realize there are lots of great businesses and great leaders that do meaningful things that are not innovative. There yeah. are also great leaders who do things that are inventive, but not meaningful, but they don't tend to run successful businesses. Um, so that's the challenge is finding both of those things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, right? To see with the innovation and where it, where it brings. And I think it's escalating as well. Because it, it goes mm. in everything, right? Um, it's mm. it is that product, it is that software, it is how you how you work, it is in workflows. It's 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 everything. I think where you see innovation, it, um, it is. But yeah. I would just say to that, as a company, one of the things we often talk about is where should we innovate? Because yeah. there is, you know, um, we are people who like to look for problems and try to solve them, but not every problem is under the scope of layers remit. And so we will talk about that. You know, is there a software tool that we can buy 
that yeah. solves the problem we're trying to solve as part of our tech stack, or should we try to build something? And yeah. I think that's also a really important piece of self-discipline is my view is if I can buy it from you yeah. and not have to create any innovation, I would love to do that so that yeah. I can focus my innovative energy in a narrow area. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I like, yeah, I, I like that because again, you can't, you can, but you know, if you build mm. everything from scratch, right. Um, that, yeah. that will take you off the focus of what your, what your company goal is in, in a few things mm, sometimes exactly. that, that can happen. Um, let's, let's dive into product development. Cause when we chatted mm. last time, just a little bit, right. We, we had a really great, great ch chat about it. So with product development, you, when it, we're all consumers, right? When we buy a product or electronic something, um, we we don't see. I don't see uh, all the iterations. I know it because I'm an engineer, so I know about it. But if you could just, you know, explore, you know, where where you work, you know, how do you how do you go into it um, and and make sure that you you set the goals and have the iterations and how many do you actually have before you have that final product that you go out and then sell to the customer. Sure, sure. I think there's a strong positive correlation between a, a product success in the market and the number of iterations that you've you've done. And one of the challenges as a startup is how do you afford to to do as many iterations as you can? So I think it's worthwhile developing a strategy just to try to increase the number of iterations that you can do before yeah. you launch something. Um, so for us, there's two components, two physical components of our product. There's a, um, a hardware component, which I have in my hand now. It's a, a small plastic enclosure with a PCB inside, which is relatively traditional. And then um, we have that connected to something you could refer to as a sensor tape. And I've got one of those in my hand now as yeah. well. And it's essentially a, a PET strip with self-adhesive on the back and a printed circuit on the front. I would say on the, on the hardware side, we've probably done a dozen iterations of the of the physical hardware. On the print side, uh, in preparation for the podcast today, I went digging through the drawers mm -hmm. that we have downstairs, and yeah. I, I, we probably have at least 50 iterations. But I think the key is that for the last 20, I don't think anyone outside of the business would be able to quickly tell the difference between any of them and there's yeah. a real lesson in that that the first five look drastically different but the last 20 most people would say oh, these are all the same thing but they're not and that's what yeah. makes a successful product is that refinement that you get through those last iterations yeah so do you have like a whole list when you develop you know a new a new product is it like must have and nice to have features or, or how do you what's your approach well it's a good question so there is somebody somebody who 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 works here um who is a absolutely critical part of the company and his he started advocating to transition his role from a essentially a junior engineer to a uh, a product management role and he identified that actually the gap for us was not just an engineering gap it was it was a product management gap yeah. and you know we supported him and and we you know <laughs> helped him go on a few product management courses and he has helped create a structure that defines that yeah, i say all that because Figuring out what your must-haves, nice-to-haves, need-to-haves are is really, really important. Yeah. And also then managing that product roadmap. Um, I think the biggest challenge is it's easy to say that you should build what customers want. But even through a high volume of conversations with customers, so let's say 100 conversations, you, you still are subject to getting lots of anecdotes. So customers might say, look, Humidity monitoring is a must-have for this product. If you yeah. don't include humidity monitoring, it's not going to work for us. And and it, that you just might be talking to the loudest customer, yeah. right? And so, how do you how, how do you make an honest assessment is a huge, huge challenge. Yeah, yeah, you have to navigate right of the feedback you're getting, and then do you then run after yeah. the new shiny object of they want this feature, or do you stay on course and keep what you actually had on your roadmap? Um, yeah, that's a balance, it's, right? a, it's a really hard balance. And the, the analogy that I use, the metaphor that I use internally is we are trying to create a menu. We're not trying to be a private chef. And we need to make sure that customers understand that we have a menu and yeah. there are there's enough on that menu that I think there's something you're going to love. But for the right price it, and the right quantity, we yeah. may be willing to customize a menu. 
there are customers who assume that we're a private chef. And what we've learned is that those customers are the hardest to serve because they really don't know what they want. Yeah. You know, they tell us they want a pizza shaped like a hamburger that's actually a cake. <laughs> and then you can't possibly satisfy them. Yeah, you need to make an animation for that one and then pop and then your product. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, what What about your design cycle then? Now that we're talking about the product, has that changed now, you know, before COVID, after COVID, how we're working, mm. hybrid, all that? How, how has that affected your design cycle? Well, certainly, um, like everyone, we went to remote working during COVID. And it's a it's challenging to give a really honest assessment because that was so early on in our development. So there was, yeah. you know, it's not a not an honest test, but doing any sort of hardware development remotely is extremely challenging just from a practical standpoint. You know, we had our equipment distributed across people's houses. Yeah. And so you were losing time because one person had borrowed the spectrum analyzer and then somebody and somebody else needs it. You know, that's just it's very, very challenging. Right. But I, I also think that there is a efficiency to working in the same in the same space. So I would say we have more of a pulsed workflow um that 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 means that for a few days a week everyone is extremely focused and then uh, on working together and then the rest of the week people are focused on individual work yeah. and probably before covid we weren't enabling that we were assuming a consistent level of group effort throughout the week which actually is much less productive because so speaking personally i today has been very quiet for me and it's been so productive on a bunch of work that I need to do by myself. Yeah. And yesterday I had tons of meetings and I, I really prefer that rather than splitting my days half and half. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think you also have to respect that everybody is different, right? Just because that's how you, mm. you work and exactly. how you have your like, yeah, the speed, yeah. you know, to, to accomplish uh, or finish your task or initiative. Right. Everybody is, is different. I think that's that's something I learned because I was like, why don't everybody just love, love, love you know, to be remote, right? And I'm like, oh, because not everybody's yeah. like me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I And building a culture which can afford different people's, um, yeah, yeah e even when they're in the exact same role or extremely similar role, they might have a really different way that they want to work. And yeah. it's, it's challenging to accommodate that. Yeah. So now touching on culture. I love that topic. Mm. So what 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 makes your company culture special? Well, I mean, I I will tell you what I think makes it special. It's hard to know. It's hard to be objective because I'm very much in the inside. Um, but you know what we aspire to do is have a culture of people who are excited by the fact that we have a fundamentally interdisciplinary technology. Um, you know, my as going back to the beginning of our talk. You know, my interest in hardware and software was that they both require different ways of looking at problems, different ways of looking at manufacturing, different ways of looking at design. And it's fun to switch between those two things, like going from the piano to the violin, right? Yeah. Um, and and we want people here who are enthusiastic about that and so far have, have been very successful in finding people that are working in a firmware role, but are very interested in the hardware side, are interested in the software side, but beyond that are interested in, in the marketing and sales function as well. So I I, I think that that finding people who have that attitude also helps us create a culture which is less prone to conflict and pettiness because people are emotionally generous and yeah. empathetic. Yeah. Um, so that's the that's the culture that I really want to create. Yeah, I like I like that. And it, it's so good also with diversity um, in the different teams of doing cross functional, right, to get input to say, hey, did you look yeah. from this side or this angle? Um, it always aspire to something better, um, to have that kind yeah. of, of dialogue. And and for me, it's it's just about uh, it's just about trying to create empathy. You know why why is it so frustrating for someone if I make a feature request at a certain point in the development process? Yeah. And and why is so, why are some feature requests really painful and frustrating, and another one which seems the same is not That's a big not. deal? Yeah. You know, and so th that I think that can not being aware of that can change the emotional state of somebody and the rest of the team. And that's 
you know, that's uh, really frustrating. And you have to understand something about someone's workflow. Yeah. So, you know, we have we have a fantastic new salesperson and a lot of his onboarding was about explaining the difference in time that it takes to implement software versus hardware features and why that is. Yeah. And that if we try to artificially speed up hardware development, we could we we would risk deploying a product that we're not fully confident in, which then really bites everyone in the butt. Yeah. And so as frustrating as it is to say, look, we should assume we're going to do two or three revisions of this. Yeah. And it's going to take this long. Even though that's frustrating, we just need to project forward to well, what if we deployed something we weren't confident in? Yeah. Right. That that's that's the really bad outcome. That's that's a good, that's a really good angle to to look at it and to communicate mm -hmm. it out as well. Um, but what about skill sets in your in your team mm -hmm. or in your organization? What's you said empathy, right? What what else? Yeah. What's our other skill sets that's important in today's world? Boy, you know, um, not everyone has an external facing role, right? So um, not everyone is is making presentations to you know external customers or partners all the time. But I think that being able to communicate effectively is really important. And so one of the things that we've done at regularly at all hands meetings is to ask everyone to introduce themselves and give their elevator pitch as if they're uh, at a wedding sitting next to somebody, right? So yeah. this is not a high pressure sales moment. It's you and I are sitting next to each other and you say, oh, Matt, what do you do? Yeah. And, and I think that's been really important because um, one, we've heard a different version of what we do from different people. And you go, oh, that's an interesting way of talking about it. Yeah. Um, it, it. And it can inspire it. It also helps make sure everyone is aligned, you know? Okay, yeah. that's, we all agree that's what we're doing. Um, but it also helps highlight subtly that the ability to summarize something quickly is important no matter what your role is. Yeah. So I would say that's another um, yeah. another really important thing. Yeah, it, it, I like it. And I like it, you know, when you're saying you, the elevator pitch, right? Oh, it's like where your parents ask the saying, you know, what are you doing, right? <laughs> yeah, they exactly, to, exactly. They need to explain it to their friends or other family yeah. members. And they're like, I'm still not sure what my daughter is doing, though. No. <laughs> yeah, so, but that, I, I mean, it's true. It's really true. I, that happens. Yeah. I can say that that, yeah. that happens with my parents is I have yeah. to explain it in a way where they can advocate for yeah. me. But yeah. But it's also... That's um, not that I'm expecting my parents to do any business development for me, but for um, they, it's important for me to equip you with a, a, a succinct mental model for what we do yeah. so that if you meet somebody and, and you say, oh, they, yeah. Matt and whoever this is should talk, you can quickly explain it. So I need to. Yeah. I, yeah, I need to do a good that job on. imparting that to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's so important as well as you're saying, if you, you know, that elevator pitch, right? It's not, yes, of course, your name is important, but it's not your mm -hmm. title, right? I think it's more the yes. the, the work yeah. you do, the impact, the feelings, what you're solving yeah. for others, right? The shorter yeah. you can explain that, um, yeah. then somebody will remember because either, you because we're all solving something, right? That's, that's not yeah. how I see it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, forget the title. Yeah. We don't need them. No, 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 no. You, you sell worldwide, right? So mm -hmm. the whole, yeah. We do. Any, any culture, you know, surprises or any difference that you've seen, right? Mm. Where you're saying, oh, here we need to, to, go, to use another approach. Well, I think that um, it's, it's cliche to say it, but uh, we find a real difference in the prioritization of, um, of ESG and environmental topics in the EU versus the US. That is the starkest difference. So, you know, layer is primarily focused on water leak detection right now. So the smart tape that we were talking about earlier is a very effective retrofitable water leak detector. We put it in buildings to prevent costly insurance claims and business yeah. downtime. But we also have the benefit of doing some really exciting direct ESG reporting, saving water, saving carbon. Um, and I'm I over the last 18 months, let's say, I've I've really tried to adjust the pitch and honestly ask people, hey, are you what are you prioritizing? Right. We can um I'll back up for a second and say, you know, I'm very aware that the first person I meet at the company at, at a prospect is likely going to become my internal champion. So 
I'm not really trying to sell to you if you are a customer. I'm okay. trying to equip you and get you excited so that you go and sell internally. And so, you know, it's that helps to create a good relationship, but it also gives me the opportunity to say, do you look, do you do you really care about water saving? Like, is that something we should prioritize? Yeah. Or are you a really financially motivated practical organization? And definitely the it's clear between the US and the EU that there's much less prioritization on resource conservation in the US. Um, Canada is stuck somewhere between the two. Okay. Um, and but yeah, we're very aware of that. Uh, and it's yeah, it's interesting to navigate as an American living in the UK as well. So yeah. I'm also kind of stuck between the two. Yeah. No, yeah, it's and that's good, right? To to see. And sometimes you have to go with mm. the toughest one, right? Because then you you fit into the market all over. Um, yep. but I'm sure that also affect your your design cycle um in mm. in the in the overall look. Um I want to chat about learnings because again, talking to you, as you just said, right? Talking to customers, you're learning of course from them. But but how do you stay up to date in within the industry? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um I I feel like I could be much more methodical about it. Um, but I, I would say if I would if I try to give some like practice practical advice or thoughts that maybe listeners can take away. Um, I'm sure they do the same thing I do, which is I sign up for tons and tons of email newsletters yes, yeah. and, it, you know, and the, it, which is funny because like three or four years ago, I would have said that email newsletters were dying, but now I, I'm on some very, very high quality newsletters that I really enjoy reading. Yeah. So that's been effective. Um, I'm a member of a bunch of LinkedIn groups um, and I go to lots of events and even the events that I don't go to, I always make sure to look at the schedule, the speakers, the panels to yeah. understand, you know, is, is ESG a panel of discussion or most interestingly in the U S recently, there are still panels that would have been called ESG, but now that that phrase has been removed ah. and now it's, it's not ESG, but the context is the same because ESG apparently has become somewhat political. So um I think that's the that's the best thing that that yeah. that I know how to do. But um I perpetually feel FOMO. I'm I'm always missing out on something. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. You need you need sleep and you need, yeah. you know, yeah, to be true. human. And, and so all kind of thing you have to to take care of as well. So with all you learn, right? If it's the newsletters and everything, how do you make sure that that actually dribbles in into the organization, these learnings, ah. or actually having a a, a col company culture that's also hunger, you know, to learn. Okay, I think there's a, a practical side to that, and then a more aspirational side. Um, on the practical side, we're constantly looking for data or trends that support, you know, support our vision essentially, which is 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 about continuous monitoring solutions making the built environment more efficient, and you know, if I find a great article that talks about um, water leaks or water savings or insurance um, insurance statistics, we have an internal database which is um, which is very simple. It's the title of whatever it is: article, yeah. presentation, YouTube video, podcast, whatever. The title, whatever the key points that. I took out of it or someone else took out of it as like a bullet point and then a link. And then we try to save a copy in case the internet, you know, um, vaporizes it somewhere. <laughs> and so we have an internal database, you know, and I, I was sitting on my desktop today, I've got like 15 things that I need to add to that. It's tough yeah. to have the self-discipline to do it. Yeah. But if you do it regularly, we look back and we go, wow, there's, this is a really valuable set of information and it's all yeah. tagged tagged to different topic areas. Um, but I think I I think um maybe the more aspirational side is having a culture of conversation um, yeah. and making sure that we we discuss that. I we don't do this well enough, but I wish that we did better company lunches. Um I I, it always sticks out to me, especially when I go to Holland and, and, and visit with customers and partners, the the culture of having lunch as a company and discussing things, which are often personal, you know, family yeah. or holiday or whatever, or, you know, politics, but they often come back to something that's contextually relevant to the business. And yeah. I think that's 
a really important cultural piece that yeah. does require everyone being in the same space. We're not going to ask anyone to go on share lunch or Zoom. Um, <laughs> that, that time is definitely over for me. <laughs> not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no. not the the happy hour we all had right no no remotely no, not anymore. Um, no. Yeah. yeah no I, and i think the everything with food right or something that is a memory or relationship um it's it's just mm. it's a good setup um for mm. for any company right or if it's again with friends right it's always a good setup to to get together um because yeah. you chit chat um, and I think that's that's what I'm missing sometimes when you have all we still have a lot of Zoom calls or team calls, right? Mm, that of course the the chit chat is just not the same because you can't have yeah. 15 on a call, right? Where they're all chit chatting to each other, right? It's it, there can be one speaking. Um so it's that that's still a challenge when you are a global team and you have these meetings. Yeah. Well, we have a we we have one person at the company who for the last two and a half or three years has run an internal book club with absolute fervor and in, un, undaunted enthusiasm. Yeah. And he doesn't always get great attendance every month, but we have a book and a film every month. Nice. And I think that that, yeah, it is nice. And it's, it's, I think what's useful about that is it, it creates a forum to make it, um, uh, to create the habit of talking to your colleagues about lots of things. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just, and that always happens over lunch. Um, and that the, the discussion happens over lunch. And I think that has been incredibly effective because we're just, we saw the same movie. We both thought it was terrible or one of us <laughs> thought it was terrible. One of us loved it, whatever. I fell, as we I fell asleep. A, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We no. can have a discussion and, 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 and we, it's, it's, you know, we watch like Hollywood blockbusters and weird, you know, uh, like obscure old films yeah. and read books about also, you know, fiction and nonfiction. So it's a very honest, um, yeah, a very honest engagement that, that I really hope will continue as yeah. we scale. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that also gives, right. That you either hate the same, love the same, or you yeah. were just disagreeing or agreeing on that. Right. It, it gives you something yeah. in common because you had, mm an experience around it. I, I like that. Yeah. That's a that's a good takeaway. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to to the to, to the lessons learned or you know when you do the iterations on, on product development. Mm -hmm. Um because in when you do product development on new devices or products or it can be software, it can be hardware, it can be mm -hmm. both, right? The the lessons learned that you had maybe the year before or it can be earlier. How do you make sure, it, and it's combined to all the learnings here, how do you make sure that these learnings keep, you know, at, that you have either access to them or you remember them yeah. so you don't do them again? Boy, that's so tough. I, I am definitely a personality that suffers from uh, a real recency bias. Yeah. You know, I, I think I have a fundamentally a salesperson's personality, which is, you know, if I close a contract sign a partner i'm having the best day of my life and two days later if i haven't done it i think oh we're screwed you know <laughs> um and so it's i try very hard to keep a running list of milestones that we've we've achieved and things we want to achieve but i think on the engineering side the challenge there is that often those insights are stuck within one person yeah. and if that person isn't organized is forgetful, doesn't bother to remember things, or if they leave, then they take all that with them. Yeah. So we we do have an internal wiki, um, <clears throat> which is pretty well maintained about engineering principles that we use and the context around why we've made those choices. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> it is when you're doing so many iterations of our smart tape as an example, it's very, very hard to maintain the discipline to yeah. do really great note taking. Um, I think code revisions, there are more tools for code, which essentially force you or invite you to, to, to note what the revision was about or what the version, the, the reason for the versioning. Um, I think with hardware, it's not, it's not inbuilt. It's yeah. very easy to do a different one and then forget why, to write why, down or why did, uh, say why. Why yeah. did we do that? Yeah. yeah. And one thing we've noted is that if there's a person who's essentially operating as a team of one, it's 
I, you know, 95% that's never going to get written down. But as soon as you have three people, you end up having to write everything down to facilitate communication. So it starts to happen automatically. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge is when it's one it's or two one. people working on something. Yeah. 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 And, and I think what you're saying also to be organized is so important. And, you know, I, I can mm. reflect on myself, right? If I'm like, oh, today, yeah, let me just, you know, do something fast. And then the week after, the week after again, I'm like, why didn't I just put it in my folder? Yeah. Why didn't I just follow my structure? Because yeah. now I have to spend this much time <laughs> looking Figuring at it out. I, yeah. 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 Um, but I think, yeah. But again, right, we can we can get better. And sometimes you, yeah, you're just running fast. Um, yeah. What about how do you measure success on your different projects or your initiatives that you have? Oh, that's a good question. We had a long discussion about that yesterday because um, I think when you're developing a product, everyone aspires to setting a timeline and setting a, a, a goal for development or manufacturing and then measuring yourself against that timeline. But the challenge is that, if especially if we're developing something new, yeah. we don't know how long it's really going to take. And it, you know, there are problems that that will exist that we're not yet familiar with. And yeah, so the unknown, we can't right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, the unknown unknowns. And so yeah. we, yesterday we discussed actually changing our approach. Um, and the previous approach was trying to diagram the whole project and then measuring deviations from that original timeline and success being essentially we delivered to the requirements on the time that we wanted to deliver, right? Yeah. Um, and, but that's very challenging. So what we talked about is more splitting up projects into conceptual buckets and agreeing um, a rough timeline at the beginning and a very detailed timeline for the first bucket. And then at the at the conclusion of each of those stages, trying to, you know, revise the rough one and detail the next stage. Yeah. I think that is a, that is very empathetic to the way that engineers operate. Um, it's more challenge. It's less empathetic to the way that the whole organization operates, um, because I have a lot of external stakeholders who will ask, "How long is this going to take?" Yeah. And I, I cannot say. Well, actually, I don't know. We're going to take it stage by stage. <laughs> um, but I think the reality is that we'll likely will have more micro and macro accuracy by looking essentially looking three feet in front of us um, every day. And then every month, we're going to look six feet in front of us. And every quarter, we're going to look to the horizon and then yeah. look back down in our feet again. Um, so it's it's very tough. It's very tough. Yeah. It's also very tough to, to measure what everyone has agreed without creating excessive documentation in a small team. Yeah. Have you ever yeah. done the exercise of going back and saying, what was the real development time? And why? Oh, certainly, certainly, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but that also requires people being organized. Um, so we ha being organized and remember and noting down. Yeah. So that they don't have to remember. So as an example, we have a new enclosure that we've developed, which has um, a gasket which is molded is part of the enclosure, and for some reason, the first parts that were coming off the tool, um, the gasket was not was not square it wasn't parallel to the edge that it should have been parallel to and it was yeah. slightly bowed yeah. and our theory was that it there was gas being trapped in the tool and that we might just have to do a subtle redesign or machining of the tool to relieve some of that yeah. but that ended up adding i think three weeks um it that kind of thing gets lost if someone doesn't note down here's the email we got from the manufacturer saying we're having this issue. Yeah. And then here's the steps that we took and here's how we revised it. So that in the future, if we do that kind of dual injection again, we'll, we'll remember a gas pocket will screw up our timeline. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Remember that. Yeah. I think it's so yeah. funny because if I look back in my career and I've done different timelines, right. And, and some, mm. especially sales, they were like, Oh yeah. Well, you know, you, you, they see it. Right. And we are saying, Oh yeah, here we like, you know, we're tooling, you know, this is you know all the different bases and then i'm like yeah we need a buffer because there's nothing that gets spit out of a tool that is spot on first time we always exactly. need that buffer and they're like no come on and i'm like no 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 no. trust me i've never never seen <laughs> totally thing where it spits out you need to you need to have time for adjustment but well and setting the right expectation you know we um 
we had that discussion with this, you know, the, and there was a lot of expectation setting. Look, this is not going to be right. It, and it might, the most frustrating thing is it might look right, but it yeah. won't necessarily be right. Yeah. Um, so, so the sales side will say, I can sell that today. And it's like, yeah. nope, because we're <laughs> claiming a specific IP rating and it's not going to meet the rating, even though it looks great. Yeah. And, you know, I think the key there is if, if the, if the engineering side is saying it's going to take five changes to the tool to get it right, then only doing three changes is a huge win. That's yeah. awesome. Right. But you have to set that expectation, yeah. um, which is tough because people want, you know, it would be like the restaurant saying, I'm going to have to bring you your dinner five times before you're going to be happy. And you're going to go, this <laughs> yeah, sounds like a terrible on. restaurant, right? Yeah. <laughs> Give me the salt. I can do it. No. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'll do it myself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I like that. Um, okay. Let's, let's do more reflection here. So I want to ask, you know, if you have to look back, man, what, what kind of, ref you know, advice would you give yourself like, like 10 years ago? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, so my Matt from 10 years ago, um, was operating with the same enthusiasm, uh, that I operate with today, but in a less focused way. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't consider myself a really, really pragmatic person, but, um, I think that the 10 years ago, uh, I was worried about worry. I was worried about working on unsexy problems. That sounds incredibly arrogant or I don't know, self-important. Um, yeah. but, um, I think that 10 years ago, Matt would have gone, Oh my gosh, you're making water leak sensors. That doesn't sound very exciting. But what I really, what I realized is that what I would have told myself to answer your question is that you should imagine problems a bit like an hourglass that, you know, I have, I have a lot of excitement about water. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the American West where water is scarce and I have a ton of excitement about that. And, and through layer, we've narrowed it down to some very specific use cases where we can make a big impact, but by doing that and making a device that's super focused and a software platform that's super focused, we now see, tons of opportunity that we never would have seen if we had, had not gone through the hourglass. Yeah. Um, trying to stay at the top of the hourglass is actually um, removes your momentum. And so I think that's what I would tell myself is like, actually the, the, the cheesy way to say that there's like uh, riches and niches, right. Is what some people would say, but I, I, I think it's much more than that. It's like the interesting stuff is, when you dive in really deep, you realize, oh, I don't have any idea what's happening here. There's just so much more interesting than I thought. So that's what I would tell myself. Stop yeah. stop floating around in the clouds. That's good. That's a really good advice. So if any of the listeners would like to connect to you, how, how can they reach out to you? So it's matt.johnson at layer.io and layer is L-A-I-I-E-R and Matt, Matt with two T's. Yeah, uh, and I'll put it in the, the show notes and also on the uh, the website episode page and that's on mindinnovation.com. So Matt, thank you awesome. so much. I think this was great. Uh, I love product development. So I'm a mechanical engineer. That's my background. So that's that's where I started. Um, and I think it, it's so interesting to, to hear about, you know, the iterations and how you learn. And then mm. I think over the many, many years, I think it's still interesting to see, right? The the whole knowledge, right? How you share it, even though if you're organized, it's, it all goes back to communication and your people and your company culture. Well, Sana, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and I hope that, that was useful for your listeners. And I, I look forward to hearing the next podcast after me because I love your podcast. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. I have a fan. Yay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Speak soon. If you like Mind Innovation, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcast. You can follow Senna Vinding and Mind Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And make sure to check out mindinnovation.com. Stay curious and keep learning. See you next time.